Before I start, I just want um, to call attention to this number here. Um, maybe if I can just get everyone to pull out your phone now and just to type this number in. Uh, so as I'm talking, uh, you can have this number in and so you can have it kind of ready for a question. And I know that some of you already have questions now. So that will just go in and it's going to be all anonymous um, and confidential. So the questions will just go to me. We don't, we, you know, so you can send, uh, you don't have to say, you know, this is from so-and-so. I mean, you could, but th that's not the point. But um, if any of you like now even have a question, use this number uh, and type in that, uh, you know, put it in your phone and, and then, but also type the question out. You can send that now. But as I'm speaking, you're probably going to have different, uh, maybe, maybe a question that might be, you know, arise and be like, I don't know what he meant, means here, or can you kind of explain more of what you mean here? And so feel free to have your phones out. I know probably, maybe, uh, you know, are there rules in youth group? Like, don't, you know, be playing with your phones during youth group. Is there? Yeah, no, that would be bad. So that's okay. I'm going to be like a rebel um, speaker and say that's okay to have your phones out so you can have, even have them on your, I mean, don't be playing games though on it, but have them out so that you can take your notes on it. You can actually be text, uh, texting in your question and they're going to go uh, to someone who's going to be pulling these questions together. Okay, so got this number, um, 269-626-22. One zero. Good? All right. So I know this topic of sexuality, not just sexual purity, but just the topic of sexuality is a very important relevant topic that many of us have questions. Like, okay, I get that the Bible says that same-sex relationships are not his will. That it's sinful. But now what? I mean, how do I talk with my, you know, queer classmate? How do I share the love of Christ to my lesbian aunt? What do I do when my cousin tells me I'm gay? really important, practical, and real questions. I think it's recognizing as we start that we've not done a good job, that we have been fairly quiet on this to the point where we have a bad reputation. When people find out you're a Christian, there's oftentimes perceptions that people project onto us. So although you might not be a certain way, for them finding out you're Christian, they already label you these certain things. There's a book called Unchristian that kind of revealed this. And what we find is, uh, and, and the survey kind of was looking at people aged 16 to 29, so around your age, maybe a little, you know, your age and maybe older, they ask young Americans, what do you think about Christians? And what they found was really surprising because it was almost all, it was all negative. Christians, we are viewed to be, from the bottom, confusing, not accepting, boring and sensitive, out of touch, too political, old-fashioned, hypocritical, judgmental, and guess what's the very, very top? Anti-homosexual. And note, 91% of those not raised in the church. That's an enormous percentage. And then 80% of those, according to the survey, 8 out of 10 of you raised in the church believe that we ourselves are anti-homosexual. And note what it doesn't say. It doesn't say anti-homosexuality. I-T-Y, three letters, big difference. Anti-homosexuality is maybe against the behavior, against the topic, whatever. That's not even what the survey showed. The survey showed that we are perceived to be against gay people. And that is wrong. 
The gospel of Jesus Christ is not against anyone. It's for everyone. It's an invitation for all people to come to know Christ. But unfortunately, people's perception is their reality. So how can we do a better job at engaging on this topic, recognizing these things, but moving forward? How can we not just respond to this topic, because responding to topics is one thing, but actually sharing Christ with our LGBTQ plus loved ones and friends? And how do we do this in a gospel-centered way? If you would like my notes, and I'm going to have a lot, uh, since you all have your phones out, you can scan this QR code and get my notes. It's a PDF file that um, it's on my Dropbox, so when you scan it, sometimes it'll ask you to sign up for Dropbox. You can say, no, thank you, I don't need another account, or you know, I don't want to give you my email, so that's fine. You can just say no or whatever. Get my, get my notes here, um, and by the way, like, if you don't know what a QR code is, <laughs> that's okay. I'll forgive you, but welcome to the 20, 21st, 21st century. Um, but you can just jot down that shortened URL there at the bottom. And um, I'm not sure if it will be in the corner, but if not, you can ask one of the youth leaders or pastor for my notes, and they will have it. So how do we have a gospel-centered way to respond well to our loved ones and friends in the gay community? How, just ultimately, how do we share Christ? Well, I, th I think it begins with a couple things. Making sure that we have the right attitude, but making sure that we change some of our wrong paradigms. So number one, we need to have the right attitude. We need to be first convicted about our own sin first. When I lived as a gay man years ago, I felt Christians were telling me that somehow gays and lesbians deserved a hotter place in hell. That Jesus had to hang on the cross a little bit longer for gays and lesbians. Because this is just one of those horrible sins. But here's the reality. Same-sex relationships are sinful, but it's not the worst sin. It's not the worst sin. And yet often we, we treat it like the un, you know, it's, it's that horrible sin, the unpardonable sin. But that's not even biblical. It's sin, but it's not the worst sin. It's not the unpardonable sin. There's only one unpardonable sin, and that's grieving the Holy Spirit, not same-sex relationships. But I know some people who would say, but, but the Bible says that it's an abomination. It does. And I will agree. Leviticus 18.22 and Leviticus 20.13 say that same-sex relationships, sex between men, is an abomination. But you know what else the Bible says is an abomination? In Proverbs chapter 6, Solomon writes, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination. And you know what he lists there? Things like lying, cheating, Pride, causing dissension. So when was the last time your friend was a little bit prideful and you say, you are abomination? Maybe we should. Because when we do, we wouldn't trivialize sin that really grieves the heart of God. But I can't help it. I mean, it's just all over us. True. It's being shoved on our throats pretty much. When I see a gay couple walking across the street... It grosses me out. And not ever that sin should be something that, like, shouldn't bother us. But we need to be careful not to confuse something that makes us feel uncomfortable with the severity of its sin. Because... I actually think that feeling of disgust we might have toward this sin or any other sin, someone else's sin, should in actuality be a reminder for us, not of, of repulsion of them, but a reminder that that feeling of disgust we have toward someone else's sin is actually just a fraction of what God feels when he looks at our own sin. 
Because our sin is just as odious in God's eyes than someone else's sin. We should be just as grossed out about our own sin as we are of someone else's sin. But we're not. We justify your sin, don't we? And if we're really honest, we like our sin. I know that sounds weird from the pulpit that we say we like our sin. But I say that because we're sinners. We like our sin. Can you imagine if sin was like a bowl of, I don't know, what's like a bowl of boiled, mushy broccoli? I mean, I love broccoli, but that's because I don't, we don't cook it to death like Americans do. Like we stir fry it. Anyone have stir fried broccoli? Yum. I mean, that's... Mm. But like, you boil things to death. I'm like, everything's gone. Like, vitamins, all that. But like, let's just say, you know, sin was like that mushy, or I don't know, what, you know, um, uh, Brussels sprouts or something like that. I love Brussels sprouts too, but that's, you know, we stir fry that too. And that's really good too. But, or roasting them. Anyway, okay, let's stop. no more food. But like, just think of like the, the food that you don't like, okay? And like, say that that's sin. Like, here, you want a bowl of that? I mean, that's easy. Be like, no, thank you right? I'm like, no, 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 I don't want any. That's not what our sin is, is it? Our sin is like, you know, double chocolate cake or, you know, something. I don't even like chocolate anyway, but something that's really, really tempting and you're like, oh, I like, I want to jump in that. That's our sin. I have a friend, Rosario Butterfield, writes on this, and I mentioned to her. She jokes and says, if your sin don't feel good, you're doing it wrong. Like, sin feels good. Let's just be honest. It feels good for the moment. But it leads to death. If sin didn't feel good, we wouldn't be tempted by it. Right? I could be like, no, 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 I don't want that. That's not temptation then. <laughs> That'd be easy. Oh, I got this all day long. Sin is something that like pulls us. It's a hook. James talks about it. It's a net. You're hooked. And like you got, it's pulling you in because we like it. Our flesh loves it. That's why we don't, we're not disgusted about our own sin. We're disgusted about someone else's sin. Oh, that's so gross. Look at what she's doing. I would never do that. Well, of course you wouldn't because that's not your sin struggle. We don't say that about our own. Like, would it, we wish, we really should say, that's so gross, my sin. Why do I do that? We, we do that in regret afterward. But when you're in it, we fall in it. We should and hope and pray we get to that point that we are disgusted about someone else's sin. So when we look at someone else's sin at how gross and disgusting and awful that is, let that be a mirror to how gross and disgusting our sin is actually to God. But he's still patient with us. And he's still loves us in spite of that. Because at the end of the day, let, let me tell you what my hope is. That people would follow Jesus. It's as simple as that. But that's never done through a holier-than-thou attitude. You know, have you ever met anyone who came to Christ through someone who's really prideful? You know, oh, I came to Jesus. This, this lady shared me the gospel and she was so pompous. Have you heard that before? I've never, ever. You know, she was so prideful. She was so holier than thou. No. It's people who are patient, compassionate, loving. They're real about their own weaknesses and shortcomings. That's what draws people, not holier than thou attitude. So number one, let's be convicted about our own sin recognizing that our sin is just as gross, just as odious in God's eyes than someone else's sin, and that ultimately leads to humility. I think humility is a great place to start. Number two, we need to be consistent. And this is consistent in three different ways. Because I think what I'm talking about consistent is we've, we've had some wrong 
thinking, some wrong paradigms that need to be corrected because we have, been, we have not been consistent with the Word of God. And one of those is regarding relationships. What is your relationship status? Are you married or are you single? And I mean, this is for you, so all of you guys are not married. That would be weird, right? But you know what's kind of weird is you go back many, many, many years ago. People your age were already married, like crazy, right? Well, I mean, but it was also because people died uh, sooner, so maybe it's <laughs> good and bad. Um, but all of you guys are single now not married, but what you find is you go off to college and after that, and you're, if you're continuing in the body of Christ, you'll find how there's a lot of community for people who are married, and that's great, but there's a deficiency in ministering to people who are not married. Because there's this perception that marriage is where it's all at. But singleness, not so much. I mean, marriage is important, but we have created this imbalance between marriage and singleness where marriage is really good and singleness is not so good. You might think, I see that, but what does this have to do with my gay neighbor? Almost everything. Because... If our hope is that they would follow Jesus, which means that as they follow Jesus and as Jesus sanctifies them, they will no longer sin and be in a same-sex relationship. Well, practically speaking, that means they won't be in a relationship for a period of time, maybe even a longer period of time. And if so, do we have a healthy place for singles to thrive in Christian community today? Not so much. We are lacking when it comes to how to best minister to single adults. What I hear a lot from youth, high school, and college kids, and why so many are leaving the faith, it's often on this issue of sexuality. I just don't get it. And it not only is on this issue of sexuality, but it's because it's unfair. What's unfair? For them not to be able to be in a relationship. For, for them not to experience love. As if marriage was the only context for love. Kids, this is a very important lesson here. Marriage does not have a monopoly on love. Marriage does not have a monopoly on love. Meaning, it's not, marriage is not the only place where love occurs. The Bible actually helps us to see that actually love can occur outside of marriage. And I argue that as much as we are pegged to be narrow-minded, when it comes to love, Christians have the most broad understanding of love. It's the world that has a narrow-minded view of love because they believe that only the most intimate, deep form of love occurs in marriage. You know the chapter on love? What, what chapter is that in the Bible? Anyone know? 1 Corinthians 13. Now, as you guys get older, I know you guys are probably, you know, too young for this, but as you get older, maybe, you know, in, in college or after college, and if you go to Christian college, you know, you're going to have like a whole slew of weddings that you'll have to go, like right after graduation in the spring. Like, just be ready. A lot of times they will read from 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is kind, etc. I mean, it's a beautiful passage. But you know, Paul did not write that chapter for a wedding. He didn't even write that specifically for how a husband should love his wife. I mean, should a husband lo love his wife and a wife love her husband in that way? Of course. But that wasn't Paul's immediate context. He was writing that to the church. How we are called to love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. 
So we have this, this lacking of, of how to minister to singleness where according to the way that the census is going now here in America, there is going to be very soon, and I don't even, I, don't, I haven't looked all, I mean, we don't have the numbers yet from 2020, but I bet that the, this census, and I mean, all the numbers are messed up because of COVID, but I believe that we're following the trend from Europe and Canada, that there are more single adults, we're not including youth like you, there are more single adults here in America than they are married adults. Does that demographic match the church? I mean, of course, there's reason for that because many singles are cohabitating. They're not getting married. They're being sexually active. That, and so, of course, we're not, you know, want that in the church. But couldn't we be missing a huge demographic simply by the way that we do church? Where singleness is viewed to be unfair, it's unfair for God to demand someone to be single because that's the only way to be happy is to be married. And single means you're going to be lonely. As a matter of fact, the Supreme Court decision that legalized same-sex marriage in June of 2015, we call that the Obergefell decision, the majority opinion was written by Justice Kennedy. And he actually wrote in his majority opinion, he said... That to deny anyone marriage would be to relegate them to a life of loneliness. Can you believe that? Being single means you will be lonely. But singleness is not equivalent to loneliness. I mean, well, that's what my, many of my gay friends say. What you want me to be is lonely for the rest of my life. But singleness is not equivalent to loneliness. You know why I can say that? Because I know some people who are married and they're still miserably lonely. So marriage is not the cure to loneliness. You know what's the cure to loneliness? It begins with a relationship with God. That is the cure to loneliness, not another person. But, some, but that is how we treat, that is how we treat singleness and marriage. Marriage is this pie in the sky, happiness. You know, when, when you guys were younger, kids, you remember what people re would read you fairy tales? Remember that? How do all... Fairy tales end. They live happily ever after. Well, first they get married. And then they live happily ever after. The end. Like, no more story to tell here. Sorry, they got married and they died. Like, nothing else to tell here. <laughs> like, what are we communicating to, your ki to our kids? What have we been communicating to you? That this is the goal in life. You get married and then that's it. No 10-year chuck-up, no 20-year chuck-up. Hopefully, they're still living happily ever after. But the real lesson is it is, not Jesus, it is not marriage that should bring you ultimate contentment. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who should bring you ultimate contentment, whether you're single or whether you're married. And we need to continue to lift up the beauty and gift of marriage. I'm not at all. And this is actually my message on sexuality often gets the most pushback here when I'm, when I'm teaching what the Bible teaches on singleness and marriage. They think that I'm denigrating marriage. They think I'm demoting marriage. But that's not what the Bible is doing. That's not what Paul is doing. He's holding up marriage, but he's not doing at the expense of singleness, which I think is what the church is doing. We hold up marriage and just poo-poo singleness. Uh, this is no good. That's not what the Bible teaches. It's saying marriage is good, and singleness in Christ is good. Like, you can do both at the same time. It's kind of like chewing gum and walking. You can do both at the same time. Amazing. Both are good. But we've treated singleness instead like a consolation prize. I'm so sorry you're single. You need to be fixed. That's why, you know, as you, as you all youth get older, and heaven forbid you're in your 30s and you're still single... You know what's going to happen? People are in church are going to try to fix you up with someone. Because you need to be fixed of this problem of singleness. But singles in the church don't need our pity. They need to be loved and treated like they're part of the family of God. So I think it's important for us to look at what the Bible says about singleness. You know in 1 Corinthians 7, there's a whole chapter on marriage and singleness, one of the most important chapters on marriage and singleness that oftentimes we just overlook. 
And in this chapter, Paul says that not only is singleness good, he calls it a gift. Can you believe that? A gift. But you know, if I can give some advice for the adults in this room who are no longer single, don't keep reminding your Christian single friends that this is a gift. Because <laughs> I know very few singles that actually believe strongly that this is a gift. It's usually the opposite. Like, I have no idea what Paul is talking about here. This is a gift because they don't feel like a gift. Like, I've yet to meet any Christian single who've made 1 Corinthians 7 7 their life first. You know, sincerely, 1 Corinthians 7 7. Woohoo! It's. <laughs> I don't know why Paul says that. I don't feel like it. Because singleness is not easy. It's difficult. But from what I hear as a single man, marriage at times can be difficult and it can be hard. But there's huge blessings that come with being married. In the same way, singleness has its difficulties, but there's also blessings that come with it. But why is it that we only focus on the enormous blessings of marriage and the enormous challenges of singleness? See how this is starkly inconsistent and unbiblical? We can all agree that marriage is a gift. Hallelujah. When it comes to singleness, we don't wholeheartedly agree that singleness is a gift. Instead, you know what we often say? We say singleness, it's a calling. <laughs> you know, not anyone can be single. You have to like really, really pray and fast that God's calling you to singleness because it's so hard. But we don't say the same thing about marriage. Sometimes I think in our push to get people married, we are actually not sanctifying marriage, but we are trivializing it. If marriage truly is this holy, amazing union of two people coming together as one, let's treat it in that way. That this is a holy, serious union that we shouldn't take lightly. But sometimes we do. I remember I was at church one time and I'm kind of a front row kind of person. My parents and I are because, I mean, I, I kind of, I don't know. I, this is before like ADHD was, you know, I, I think that's what, I, if I was living now, I would definitely be like, you know, diagnosed as ADHD. I'm just like a, you know, squirrel, you know. So I, I've got to stay in the front row to, you know, get my blinders on. Um, but we got there early and there was like something that people are gathering in the back and talking and there's, I, I heard, you, you know how you like try to pretend you're not eavesdropping, but you really are? So I was listening, and, uh, and, and, you know, they're talking about, oh, you know, you know, I just met this one girl, and, you know, and they're like, oh, my goodness, congratulations. And I'm thinking, he hasn't done anything. Like, he still don't have a job, you know, he's still living at home, don't have a car, none of that, but congratulations, you know, you met someone. Like, not, what's her name, is she following Jesus, and, it, you know, is this God's will? Like, none of that, but just say, oh, I'm so happy for you. Like, I just wonder if we actually, like, act really seriously challenge people. I mean, I think it's, as a good friend, we should be the ones that say, is this God's will? Or are you just following your heart? Because if you're following your heart, let's pray about this. If you are going after her because she's just a pretty face, is she loving Jesus? You know, I'm open to getting married. But I, I, I follow my example is from this missionary lady that I don't even know who said this quote, but she was a, miss, a single missionary all her life. And, and people would all ask her, don't you want to get married? And she kind of got tired of people asking anymore. And what she said was so profound. She said, I want my life to be so hid in Christ that for a man to find me, he must find Christ first. That's what I want. I'm open to getting married, but I'm not on the hunt. You know how some people are on the hunt, and that's just not pretty. I'm, I'm open to it, but I want God to, I mean, if... I want my life to be so hid in Christ that for a lady to find me, she must find Christ first. That's holding up the sanctity of marriage. You know, marriage is... My, 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 all my Christian friends are married, and they tell me marriage takes work. It's not easy. It's, loving yourself, by the way, it's hard. Loving unconditionally, it's difficult. But then we see, even, even Paul, Ephesians 5, says, Husbands, lay your life down for your wives. So young men, pay attention. When marriage, 
Lay your life down for your wife. Amen, ladies? So that's, that's a really high, nearly impossible calling. So do you know what I say, tongue-in-cheek? I say marriage. Whew, that's a calling, seriously. <laughs> Single, that's, that's a gift. I don't have to lay my life down for any, anyone yet. But I'm not at all saying that marriage is not as good as singleness. I'm simply looking at the full counsel of God and recognizing this truth that godly marriage and godly singleness are two sides of the same coin. We should, only, we should no longer only emphasize one over against the other. Because I don't think we're ready to address sexuality until we first redeem singleness. Second, we need to be consistent regarding sexuality. What is God's standard? And I touched on this in my testimony. Is heterosexuality the goal? That seems to be what it is. Isn't that what the Bible promotes? You know, that the Bible, you know, we see in Genesis that God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. So we see, I mean, isn't that then the standard heterosexuality? But let's think about this. If heterosexuality was the goal, that means being attracted to the opposite sex, being sexually intimate with someone of the opposite sex... That's pretty broad, so broad that I could be sleeping with half a dozen women, and that's considered heterosexual, and even natural. I could be a married man, and I'm cheating on my wife with another woman. That's also heterosexual. I could be an unmarried man living with my girlfriend in a monogamous relationship, but we're not married. We even have a couple children together. That's also considered heterosexual. Those three scenarios that I just gave you are all sinful in God's eyes. Heterosexuality might be the correct direction, but it's way too broad. It's trying to use a, 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 you know, a shotgun when we need a laser. So what then is it? If heterosexuality is too broad, then what is it? Not heterosexuality, not homosexuality. That's a wrong paradigm. I think we need to set that aside. I think those terms should, shouldn't even really be terms that we use anymore because that's not even the right playing field. It's not the right court. We need to use the correct framework, and it's a biblical one. Heterosexuality and homosexuality is a secular framework. Secular vocabulary. The correct one is holiness, not heterosexuality, not homosexuality, but holy sexuality. What is holy sexuality? When you are single, which all you youth are now, how are you going to live? You're going to be sexually absent. Then the other path is when you are married, biblically married, in the way that the Bible defines it, one man, one woman, you're going to be faithful to your spouse of the opposite sex. So holy sexuality is this, chastity and singleness or faithfulness in marriage. Chastity and singleness, or faithfulness in marriage. And what I realized was there was no one term to include both of those, so I created a term. The concept is not new. The term is holy sexuality. And what I like about this term is this applies to every human being, whether you're man or woman, young or old, opposite sex attractions, same sex attractions, we all need to pursue holiness. See, heterosexuality actually should never define a person, as I said in the first hour. It's, it shouldn't, we shouldn't say this is a heterosexual person. It defines our feelings, our attractions, and our behaviors. Big difference. So we need to consist regarding sexuality, uh, um, relationship sexuality, and lastly, change. Does change mean going to gay, from gay to straight? No. How about that you no longer have these attractions or temptations? Well, if we have that same standard, do we apply that to any other sin struggle? Say I have a friend who was a drunk, comes to Christ, stops drinking. But he admits he still has an urge to drink, but he doesn't. Would we tell him you haven't been changed? We need to lay some hands on you. You need some deliverance. No, because the manifestation of God's grace is more evident in his life because he says no to his flesh and says yes to God. So change is not the absence of temptations, but change is the spirit wrought ability to be holy, even in the midst of temptations. So we need to be consistent, we need to be uh, convicted, we need to be consistent, and then third, we need to be compassionate. I taught at Moody for 12 years, and every semester I had students that confided with me that they're wrestling with their sexuality. And oftentimes, because they feel, you know, they, they tell me they haven't told anyone, because they feel so isolated, 
They also tell me sometimes they wrestle with depression and even thoughts of suicide. So for some, this can be an issue between life and death. So how can we be a safer place to help people say that, you know what? It's okay to open up about this. Number one, we need to just expect that this is present here in our own churches, in our own small groups, in our own homes, in our, you know, in our pews. Not be surprised. I mean, what's the body of Christ? Are we a group of people who've got it all together, don't have any problems? We meet once a week, we hold hands, and we sing Kumbaya. Is that what we are? Or is the body of Christ a group of people who know that we are broken and we need Christ? I'll just be honest with you. I am broken and I need Christ. Anyone else out there that can relate to that in any way, shape, or form? And so let us all hand in hand walk together to him, not because I can fix you, but because I know someone who can. Second, know what is your position. And you might think, I know my position. It's wrong. Well, yes. But is that like our main takeaway, what's right and what's wrong? Or is our main takeaway this? Follow Jesus. How in the world can you say no to sin if you don't have Christ living in you? You can't. So number one thing, our main takeaway when we talk about anything should be follow Jesus. You can't fix someone up and then bring them to Christ. You can't help someone say no to your sin or even know that you're living in sin without them coming to Christ. Third, maybe you're here because you have a friend. Or maybe you're thinking right now, be like, man, I've always wondered whether this person or, you know, my good friend wrestles with their sexuality. I kind of thought it, about it in the back of my mind. And how do I bring it up to let them know I'm there for them so I can walk with them? Don't. <laughs> Just imagine if someone came up to you out of the blue and said, hey, do you have same-sex attractions? Awkward. Okay, just let you know. But instead, what you can do, give, give assurance of your friendship. Tell them, I thank God for you. I just want you to know nothing can change my friendship. Fourth, let's be a group of people who say no to the gay jokes and the bullying. I think this is important for us as youth. There's no place in the Christian life to make fun of anyone. Ever. So can we agree to that, guys? Guys and gals, no more. Like, I mean, it might seem funny for a moment, but you never know when someone might ha even have a cousin or whatever that has a loved one who they're praying for. And when we make fun of them, that's make, making fun of their cousin, their aunt. So instead of saying, that's so gay, I don't can, you know, you know, that shirt is so gay. You know, a shirt cannot be gay. Clothing do not have sexualities. It's not a real thing. Let's be more crit. like, okay, here's a novel idea. Expand your vocabulary. Like, what an idea. Like, learn new words, you know. Instead of saying, that's so gay, how about, that's a Presbyterian, or that's a Baptist, or that's a, you know, whatever. You fill in the blank. Something really creative there. I'm sure you can think of something good. So we need to be convicted, consistent, compassionate. Fourth, we need to be complete. And this is complete in our message. We focus upon God's truth because it's the truth that sets us free. So the question is, well, what is God's truth when it comes to this? Oh, I got this. It's a sin. Anything more? No, that's it. It's a sin. Well, that's all we say. That's equivalent to giving someone a one spiritual law track. You guys remember the four spiritual laws? This is not the four spiritual laws, but the one spiritual law that goes something like this. You're a sinner and you're going to hell. Sorry. In case you didn't know, that's not good news at all. That's bad news only. But if you think about it, that's all we've been telling the gay community. That's all we've been telling them. You're a sinner, you're going to hell, there's no hope for you. No wonder why the gay community want nothing to do with us. No wonder why people in your school want nothing to do with you as a Christian. Because our message to them has only been bad news. There's nothing good about it. We've been only telling them the incomplete truth, not the complete truth. And you know when you tell someone an incomplete truth, that's just as harmful as telling someone a lie. So what is the complete truth? In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he lists uh, uh, ten sins. And in this list of ten sins are two Greek words that focus upon homosexual behavior. That sometimes people look at all these verses and say, Look, gays and lesbians won't inherit the kingdom of God. But they conveniently forget about the eight other sins. Because if we look at all ten sins, none of us should inherit the kingdom of God. 
But Paul didn't stop there. He says in one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, where he says, such were. What tense is that verb? Past tense. Such were some of who? You. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. You know that verse actually is not good news. That's amazing news. That's news that we can tell anyone who needs to know about Jesus Christ. That you can have, you can be redeemed. You can be justified in the name of Jesus Christ. So our message has to be redemptive. If you're not sharing the good news with someone, there's no hope in that. Our friends in the gay community, their main issue is not sexuality, but their main issue is to follow Christ. My biggest sin was not same-sex relationships, but my biggest sin was unbelief. So I'm going to kind of uh, go through some really, really practical things here at the end was, uh, because I'm really going over time. But how do we be redemptive? And I'm, I'm going to give you some tips on um, ministering to Christians who know this is sin and they have same-sex attractions and then sharing Christ with those in the gay community. What would you say, let's say after this weekend, after this workshop, next week, next month, next year, you have a good friend that confides with you. I have same-sex attractions. What would you say you're due? Number one, thank them. Thank you for sharing this with me. It took a lot for you to be brave and courageous. It means a lot. Number two, tell them that, and of course, don't freak out. You can freak out in your inside voice, but don't freak out. Number two, tell them that you're not alone. Tell them, you know what? I'm a sinner just like you, and I need Jesus just like you do. Don't believe the lie that you are so strange or unique or this is a particular sin. This is just sin. And at the end of the day, we all need Christ together. And I have my own struggles. You have our, your own struggles. They might look different, but at the end of the day, it's sin and we need to pursue Christ together. Number three, and I touch on this uh, in the first talk, which is really important, identity in Christ. Nothing can be, I think that's so key. Don't put your identity in your attractions. Don't make this who you are. None of you should even say, I'm a straight Christian. That's not who you are. And some of you young girls be like, well, I don't have sexual feelings. Does that make me asexual? No, that makes you a girl. Girls, it's not, I mean, many girls, they don't have sexual feelings. That does not make you asexual. That makes you a girl. A lot of times, you know, that's how guys, and I'm going to say something, and I hope I really don't offend anyone, but guys and girls are different. I know shocking. I know that might sound really strange because you've heard something different, but guys and girls are different. Can I get an amen for that? Can I get a hallelujah for that? Hallelujah. So we see that there's difference and it's gloriously different. So we know that our identity needs to be in Christ. Fourth, be realistic. Don't just, you know, say, oh, we can pray away the gay. No, prayer is good, but we don't pray away our problems. Number five, don't focus on the externals, how people walk or talk. That's not as important as true heart change. Number six, and this gets to my point, like as I said in my main talk about community. What I need most as a sinner is I need Christ and I need the body of Christ. So press into these relationships in the body of Christ. So how do we share Christ with those in the gay community? Here's the things that you should not do. Do not compare this with an addiction, pedophilia, or murder. <laughs> not a good thing, right? Like, if you want to win people to Christ, that's just not helpful. Number two, and this might seem as a surprise, don't use these two words, lifestyle or choice. I never use those words as a gay man. You know why? I had the wrong identity. I didn't view this as what I did. I view this as who I was. Number three, don't feel the need to, oh, don't say love the sinner, hate the sin. Do it, don't say it. <laughs> when you tell someone, I love you, but I hate your sin. They don't feel loved. So just do it. Don't say it. Number four, don't feel the need that you always have to debate people with people. And I know, you, you know, as a high school student, you might be like, well, people ask me all the time, do you think this is sin? And I'm like, I got to speak truth to them. But you know, we need to realize that sometimes the question that people are asking is not the question of utmost importance. Because morality will never lead anyone to Christ. Instead, you could kind of divert it to the more important question and say this. I know you don't even believe in God, so what does it matter to you what God thinks? Instead, let's talk about the existence of God. When you talk about God and His Son Jesus, those conversations will lead to salvation. So what should you do? Number one, pray. 
pray and fast. Number two, listen. Don't be quick to speak, but be quick to listen. Three, we need to uh, be intentional. Go across the street and invite your gay neighbor over for lunch or a coffee. And I know you're thinking, but if I do that and have, a, have them in my home, wouldn't I be condoning their sin? Good question. But last time I checked, we usually have sinners over for dinner. Nothing new. You're just eating with them. You're not sinning with them. There's a little difference. Number four, be patient and persistent. God's in the long haul, and so should we. Number five, uh, number five be transparent. Share what God is doing in your life. Because you're like, I don't know what to say. Talk about Christ. I mean, naturally, let it flow. Ask about them and find ways that you can kind of insert what God means to you. Because I would never have considered the gospel if I didn't see the gospel live out in my parents' lives. I wouldn't have picked up the Bible from the trash can if I didn't see the Bible lived out in my father's life and my mother's life. I didn't leave pursuing same-sex relationships because my parents convinced me I was living in sin. Actually, I left same-sex relationships because they showed me something better. And his name is Jesus. Our job, my friends, is to show a dying world out there that no matter what they're clinging to, all the fools going to the world, not only is Jesus better, but following Jesus is best. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, I pray that you would renew our minds, that we would remember that we need to put our identity in you. We need to put our faith in you. And as we live as Christians, put our identity in you. We love you, God, and we ask this in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, Amen.